magic scope. Um, today, oh, let me bring this back up for funsies though. It's the head of, top of the broadcast. Um, so today is a little bit more low tech because I don't have my microphone or I don't have my camera D DSLR Canon set up because um, I don't have my charger. So I realized I think my next investment for equipment is going to be like one of those um, battery things that you can plug in to adapt your camera so you can plug it into the wall. Because otherwise when you, I live broadcast through my camera, my Canon DSLR camera, it really, the battery goes pretty fast. Um, hello, thanks for the HAPS hug award, David. Um, yes, yeah, so hi everyone, welcome to the, today's broadcast. My name is um, Issa Betancourt, host of the Bug Scope, and today I'm broadcasting from the museum. And because I have a lot that I'm trying to do today while I'm at the museum, I thought that this will be a sort of like work while broadcasting episode question mark because <laughs> I need to digitize some Lepidoptera specimens. So we'll see how it goes. But um, it's kind of like an op another open broadcast where if you guys do have a request to see something from the collection, I can go um, and pull a drawer out to show you. Um, it's not going to be as crisp this week because I don't have the DSLR camera, but it's my computer camera. But um, but yeah, today I'm working with some of these specimens, which, hi Peter, how's it going? Uh, these are Lysenid. The butterfly is called Lysenid. You can see the scientific name on the side here. And they're also called blues. That's one common name. They have some other common names too that I'm not remembering right now. But this is a really interesting group of butterflies. These ones specifically as the title of this broadcast. Hi, Lars. How are you? Yes. Oh, whoa. The, I thought that I changed the name of the title, but I guess I did not change the name of the title. Maybe I forgot to press save when I went to change the name of the title. <laughs> um, hi, Jason Park. Hi, Matthew. How are you guys doing? Um, and Lars, hey. Um, yeah, so... I'm at the museum again, the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philly, and I'm working on digitizing. I was gonna, I was gonna use, I want, I meant to change the title to say computerizing, which I like wasn't sure if I was making that up or not, but apparently computerize is a word. Um, that's basically the same as digitizing, and I think that computerizing is a nice, like very, I think it's very understandable if that makes sense to you. <laughs> okay. But before we do get into any chat about these specimens, I do want to bring back a tradition from the past. And yeah, I have this scarf around because it's chilly in the collection. Um, but in the past, we've used this book, which I want to get my own copy of it too. But we've taken a look in this huge, giant, giant book of entomology terms to pick out some random, there's a lot of words in entomology to describe the bugs because with over a million species um, and all these different forms and functions. There's a lot of descriptor words that are needed. There's a lot of names that are needed to um, refer to different species and body parts and wings and feet and internal organs and all sorts of things, antennae. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna uh, let you guys pick a letter and then we will take a look in this book um, at a random section and I'll just like put my finger down and then or pick a number maybe pick a number I'll pick and I'll pick the eighth number written in the chat so David wrote the first number but I'm going to pick whatever ends up being the eighth number in the chat that I see is going to be the page that I go to to find um, the word and and so you guys know this book is 1502 pages so any pick a number between 1000 uh, one maybe one maybe does it start at one or does it is that like the, the beginning no i think it starts maybe it does start at one i think it does so we have one two three four four numbers so keep on adding numbers and whichever one ends up being 
the eighth number that is lined up in the chat is the number that I will go with. And if you already put a number down, you can put down another number too. Um, all right, thanks for popping by and saying hi, David. Take care. All right, I think, wait, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think 250 is the number. Let me see, wait. One, 145, 27, eight, one, it's hard to count while counting numbers, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, eight. So 250 is the number. So thanks everyone for participating. All right, so page 250, which is way in the section C. And now I'm gonna close my eyes and pick. Um, all right, this one's a pretty good one. This word that we have come across today, I don't know if you guys, which way you guys see this, is Campodeiform, Campodeiform, which means it's an adjective. So like I said, a lot of words to describe things in entomology. It's from Greek, Greek, campe equals caterpillar plus eidos equals form, which is um, plus Latin, forma equals shape. Oh, which, which is form comes from Latin, Latin meaning shape. Okay, so it's Campodea shaped. Does that resonate with you, Frank, out of curiosity? Um, since you are, you speak German. Um, is that how you guys, is that the word for caterpillar? Or is that like ancient Greek, maybe? Campe, K-A-M-P-E. Okay, so it's a term applied to elongate larval forms characterized by a pro, uh, prognathous head, long thoracic legs, and multi-segmented urogonfi. I don't know what urogonfi is, but anyway. Camp um, campodiform larvae are often predaceous, aka they like to go eat other animals. They're predators. Um, thanks for the super heart, Lars. Cheers. Dumb it down so we can understand, says Matthew. <laughs> um, so... So I have to do that for myself too, because it's pretty dense. So it's basically saying it's a slender form, um, like a caterpillar. And this is a term that would be used for, I think, different beetle larvae. And it's ones that are just kind of slender and long, like a caterpillar is long. But as it's saying, these types of larvae are often predaceous. And I think that um, it's... I think that's some, it's ground beetles. Let me see if I can bring one up. Um, and I'm gonna type this word in the chat so you guys can see. But it refers to larvae, like, um, oh, maybe I have a picture, like lacewing larvae. Here, I'm just gonna share my screen so you guys can see what I'm seeing right now. Big juice, hello, thanks for subscribing. Okay, window, here we go. Can I show me too at the same time? Oh, wait, I think I can. I'm pretty sure I, I, sh I think I've shown my face and the screen at the same time. Okay, now it's working. All right, yeah, so, so, um, as, wait, we're rivals? Wait, how? Wait, does it, because of Philly? Because of Pennsylvania? Anyway. All right, so here is an example. This is up here is a, can you see that okay? Can you see my mouse? Yeah, you can see my mouse, cool. This up here is a lace wing larvae and that is in sort of a caterpillar form and it's predaceous. It eats aphids and all sorts of different things. It's called an aphid lion. So this is an example of a um, camp campidea form insect. And then here too, I guess it's maybe a snake fly larva, as this caption suggests, potentially, is also in that sort of formation. And to give you some contrast, because obviously sometimes you can be like, this is this, but you don't know what it means without something else to put things on a spectrum to understand it. Like, how do you know when something is dark if you don't know what light is? So for some comparison, here's some other images. 
but here we go. Here's another description. Thank you to SlideShare. Straight body, legs well developed, mostly predators. Oh, ladybug beetles too is another example here. Um, here. Um, I think that's I spelled that something somewhat right. There we go. So here's a, here's a contrast. So there's that type of larva, but then you have ones that are curled up like this. That I guess it could be confusing because this also looks like a caterpillar, but their default way of being is in this curled up shape. And then these ones like to eat roots and things like that. This is what scarab beetles like, um, like the fig eaters or like dung. I think dung beetles, like, I suppose, because they're scarabs. Scarab beetles. Um, will be in this other formation. So in contrast, Frank's saying, just wanted to say, looked very kind of uh, ladybug-like. Yes, yep. So yeah, exactly. They do good connection there. They do fit that. Oh yeah, so here's, for example, yep, C-shaped, have a well-developed head and usually possess thoracic legs, but lack prolegs. Thoracic legs are um, like the legs of a, of an insect are divided into like the front legs, middle legs, and back legs. And so, um, oh, sorry. Oh, this is, I'm sorry. I'm kind of mixed up right now. But um, going back to the word of the day, Cambodiaform. Um, yeah, so this is it. This is our word of the day. This is a nice, this megaloptera or helgramite larvae, um, which is not a beetle. This is a whole different group also is a good example of that type of insect body form. So thanks for joining us for this word of the day. Do they come out after it rains? Wait, do what come out after it rains? Halgramites, is that what you're asking? Because they will come out when it's raining out because they pupate on the banks of the water. Oh, Michigan. Wait, does it say I'm in Michigan? How did Michigan come up? I was in Michigan, but I'm not in Michigan right now. But I suppose so. I've never been to a big football game before, though, Big Juice, but one day I'd like to go. And I'm, I'm not a student at Michigan, nor really. I'm connected I've been connected to University of Michigan through my husband, who's a graduate student there too. But cheers. Maybe when I do finally make it to a big football game, it'll be against Ohio State. Um, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Have you seen them, Matthew? Have you seen them out when, when it's rained? I'm going to take a picture of the word of the day so we can reflect on it later. Um, I am curious about that what the U-R-O-G-O-M-P-H-I is. I will look that up before we go B. It is the process on the oh okay. Here, I'll share this screen too. So you got so to dissect the whole entire um, meaning of this word. So this definition talked about how Campidaeiform is a term applied to elongate larval forms characterized by a pro prognathous head, which means a frontward facing head, versus like curved facing downward. Um, and then long thoracic legs, so the legs are long, and multi-segmented urogonfi. And so the urogonfi right here um, in certain insect larvae, it's a process on the terminal segment, also known as a pseudocircus. So if you've been with, with me for a while on the bug scope, you maybe remember a uh, long time ago I said I had... We talked about cerci, basically, which are almost like hind 
it's these things right here. The pseudo circus um, or pseudo circe um, are like kind of high and almost like high end antennae, these sensitive back appendages that I think are used in various ways depending on the insect. Like earwigs have huge cerci. Um, but in this case, I guess when it's an urogomphus or urogomphi, it's like a shorter, stubbier appendage that um, is on the back of some insects, like larval insects. So there we go. The more you know. Yes, he's still a graduate student at Michigan, David, and he's hoping to get wrap up his dissertation by May. He wants to graduate in the spring. Yeah, so hopefully you we've all learned something new today. I didn't know what a year of was until just now. Or if I did, I had forgotten, and now I've relearned. So, all right. Cool. Always good to dive a little bit more into the world and, and understand the wonders around us. Yeah, so, so you'll come across an insect that is Campideiform if you look and find a ladybug larvae. If you look and you find a lacewing larvae, oftentimes you'll find them on surfaces that are covered with aphids because that's one um prey that these type of insects like to go after and then also sometimes if you are looking in leaf litter or in the soil or under a rock and you see something scurry along that's long and slender it may very well be this form of a larvae because they run they can run fast the scarabiform scar scarab right scarabidae forms I think I'm mixing up that a little bit, but <laughs> the C-shaped ones are very slow larvae in comparison. They, they don't chase down insects to eat them, which is why. What is this book? Asks Matthew. It is a wonderful book, a dictionary of entomology, uh, edited by Gordon Gord, Gord and David Hedrick. Yeah, second edition. Um, so has, wow, it says incorporating an estimated 43,000 definitions. This major reference work is a comprehensive, fully cross-referenced collection of terms, names, and phrases used in entomology. It is the only listing that covers insect anatomy, behavior, biology, ecology, histology, molecular biology, morphology, pest management, taxonomy, and systematics. Common names, scientific uh, binomial, and taxonomic classifications are provided, as well as order, suborder, superfamily, family, and subfamily names, and diagnostic features of orders and families, which is what we looked at. We looked at something that's like a diagnostic feature of certain insect groups um, with new and updated terms, particularly in molecular biology, phylogeny, aka the tree of life, and spatial technology. Interesting. I don't really know what it refers to when it's, it's saying spatial technology. This revised new edition of the Reference Reviews Top 10 Print Reference Source 2004 is an essential reference for researchers and students of entomology and related disciplines. The end. No, the end of the back description of the book. But I would say, yes, it's like a very intense, um, seems like it covers everything book as far as I can tell. So. I do love this book. I like, maybe this is what got me into science. Like I like having the foundational pieces to put together the story or to have a full complete understanding. And so dictionaries, things that define things can be helpful for poking around and exploring. So yeah, I do like this book a lot. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so if you guys have any requests of something that you are interested in seeing in the collection today while I'm here, let me know. I probably won't be back in the collection for a while because I'm going back to Georgia next week. But um, here are some of the other 
lyseated butterflies and going back to that topic that I opened up at the beginning of this broadcast. You can see they really have this nice, beautiful blue sheen. And I'm in Philadelphia at the moment, yeah, at the museum. And the underside is gray of these butterflies. And it's really easy to not see them. It's very easy to not see these butterflies because when they fly, they're just so like, they're so silvery and small that they just kind of flit around. And I think most people when they see them think that what they're seeing is a moth when it's actually a butterfly. And I've seen them in the most urban places in the world, this species, not sorry, not species, this family, Lycenidae, and yeah, almost purple. Yeah, some of them, yeah, they do look very bluish purple. Mm -hmm. These ones look even more purple, this species down here. This is Celestrina lucia. That's the first one I showed you. And this one is Cupido uh, Camintas. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but there's many different ways. You can, different pronunciation approaches are acceptable in this world of entomology. Um, once again, the parentheses at the end is the author, the, the scientist, the uh, systematist, or taxonomist who described the species. And it's their name is in parentheses. It wouldn't be in some cases, um, like in this case with this species, Celestrina idella. You can see the authors, there's two of them. Their name is not in parentheses because this species has remained in its original um, genus that when it was described. But if the, so right and Pavulan um, describe the species and it stayed with this name for its, the entirety of its existence. However, with this one, Salastrina lucia by Kirby, um, the parentheses indicate that the species was not always in the genus Celestrina. It was moved to Celestrina from some other genus. And because of that, we put the, the name of the author Kirby in parentheses. It's an interesting system, but it does help give information um, on understanding the species. And uh, actually, I wonder how that was decided but maybe it just makes it more helpful when trying to figure out the synonyms, AKA, yeah, if that makes any sense. Okay. Oh, can you find some, a specimen by location, e.g. something that was found in the Arctic or Antarctic? Unfortunately, we're not at that point yet. That's a good question. Um, I could find it potentially if we knew that it only existed in those places and I found that we had it in our collection. Um, I know that one of my one of our colleagues here who's an archaeologist, Ted Deschler, he's collected a bunch of artifacts in, the, in Antarctica, but he is a paleontologist, so not entomology. Hi, Jason. Jason asks, the butterfly exhibit at the museum is still closed to the public. Unfortunately, it's still closed to the public um, because um, you're not the person who asked me this at Numbers Night, are you, out of curiosity? Um, but yeah, it it's closed to the public probably until the COVID restrictions lift and the world kind of is back to where it used to be. Because of the COVID restrictions, it lowers the capacity of the museum and it's expensive to get for the museum to get that exhibit up and running again because of the importing of the butterflies and managing um, the conditions of the exhibit. So um, unfortunately, yeah, it's still on pause, but I certainly hope that it's up and running again soon. Yeah. Um, oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice, the museum's a nice place. 
perhaps I'll take you guys on a museum tour sometime soon. Um, well, I don't know when that one soon will be because my schedule is kind of all over the place and I'm bouncing between Philly and Georgia these days. But, um, and Michigan, I guess, sometimes too. But, um, what's it called? Oh, to clarify, because David is saying the butterfly moved species with the thinky face. And I definitely want, I want to give a shout out and say the thinky face emoji is one of my favorite emojis because it's like the curiosity emoji, I suppose. <laughs> um, uh, if I said it changed species, then I maybe I misspoke because it's always the same species. It's just the name is like, so the second name, um, so I can make sure everyone's on the same page here. But so Celestrina lucia is the full name for it. And Celestrina is the genus. Lucia is the species epithet. And so like Lucia is always going to be tied with this species. But maybe they find that it's actually better with the genus Cupido. And so they need to move Lucia, this, this species, into the Cupido. So it's now Cupido Lucia. Um, but sometimes people come along and they describe this species all over again. Like say I found this butterfly and I was like, oh my gosh, I think it's a new species. And then I write a description, I publish it, and I say this species is now um, Philadelphia. <laughs> Philly, the, Philly, the uh, genus, and Delphia, the species. Um, and then someone's like, wait a second, like Philly Delphia is not a new species. That's actually Cupido lucia that you have here. Then my, my species that I described or that term is now officially a junior synonym, a synonym. So, if, so someone might come across my description that I published and be like, oh, this is what it is. But it's actually invalid and not real because not ac accepted as the name because I came along after somebody else already described the species. And this doesn't happen so much anymore because of how connected the internet uh, makes us all. And it's a lot easier to see, to find information and resources on what's been described already. But like back in the day, I think a hundred years ago, um, how, how was it prevent how did you prevent describing a species when if you have the same species in Europe and the same one in the USA? Like two people could easily have tried to publish published on the same species and it didn't wasn't found out until years later. So um that it's probably a tangent from what you were bringing up, David, but I it's a concept that comes up a lot, especially in an old collection like this one where we have so many specimens from like 1906, 1914, 1923. So we have a lot of specimens that are whose names need to be updated because they're synonyms, invalid junior synonyms of the valid accepted name. Yeah, so so yeah, renaming or like re Fixing, it's more like fixing the name or updating the, updating the name. Yeah, rather than renaming, I'd say, but it's like updating the name or reassigning the name. If it's, if it's going to a different genus because of added morphological data that says, hey, it's more related to this genus than that genus, then I'd call that like re a reassignment based on new evidence. That, that helps to refine the, our understanding of the relationship. Interestingly, this one's called Celestrina neglecta. I don't know why it's called neglecta. Um, I wonder if there's something in its life history that caused it to have the word neglect in the name. <laughs> but there is, Matthew, there is a YouTube channel and you can find videos for the Academy of Natural Sciences. And um, they also have a bunch of videos on, on Facebook as well, which I encourage you to check out. There are some really nice ones of related to entomology, 
There's one that was done this summer with my supervisor, John Gilhouse, about him. It's kind of following him going in the field and collecting, and then the process of bringing specimens from the field into our collection here and preparing them for the collection and whatnot. Um, because it's not well researched. Sure, you're welcome, Matthew. Um, I don't know. Um, let me see if like bug guide said anything about it. Celestrina neglecta. Um, oh, it's the summer azure, which is a pretty common one, I'm pretty sure. Um, you know who would know? Like my coworker would know. Maybe I'll go ask him and I can come back and report back. So. Yeah, I don't know why it's called it. Called that. I'll be right back. I'm very curious. I'm going to go ask. So maybe I'll tilt this down so you guys can look at them while I, while I go ask my coworker and ponder. Ponder the mystery. All right, um, I didn't find Jason who's Lepidopterist. Hi, Marilyn, how are you? But I found my coworker, Greg, and I asked him, and he suggested, he's not 100% sure, but he suggested, he hypothesizes that it's called Celestrina neglecta, potentially because it is a butterfly that's really common and found in many places, but it, just like, it took a long time for people to recognize that it was a species that had not been described. Like this happens, this happens sometimes where like, it's so common that everyone's like, oh, like someone must know what that butterfly is or like you never collect it because it's just everywhere. And so perhaps, um, perhaps it's called that because it was overlooked, neglected, but hmm. It was described in 1862, so, so I'm not sure actually. I would expect it to have been described more recently. Hmm. I'm not sure. Um, we need to ask Jason too. Maybe I'll go see if he's around. You guys okay if I leave for another moment to find Jason? I'll um, tilt some of the butterflies toward the camera. I need like a BRB thing. <laughs> All right. 
BRB. But I don't know. All right. Hi, everyone. So I wasn't able to find Jason, but maybe we'll just leave this broadcast like that with this lingering mystery. And I will do my best to find the answer, to bring you an answer next week when we reconvene for next week's broadcast. But um, yeah, I don't know why it's called Neglecta, <laughs> because it was described in 1856 um, or 52, or when was it described? 1862. That sounds like it was way too long ago for it to have been because it was overlooked. But I don't know. The mystery remains. All right, I'm going to go, but talk to you guys later. Have a great week, and keep your eye out for... My seat it's getting a little chilly in the northern hemisphere, but but yeah, cheers. All right, bye.